And if you think preaching against love isn't blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, then I don't know what is. Was Jesus silent on the morality of homosexuality? Did Christians get gay marriage wrong just like they got interracial marriage wrong? Is condemning the relationship of two people who love each other blasphemous? Well, the fellow that I'm going to respond to today certainly thinks so. As always, let's dive in. We were so excited to worship and hear the word of God, but we didn't know what we were walking into. Worship was beautiful, but then... They say, you can't drink. He says, I'm going to make wine at this party when we run out. They say, I'm going to be judgmental. I'm supposed to be judgmental. Jesus says, you should not be judgmental. Otherwise, you will be judged. They say that nobody of the same sex should ever get married. Jesus goes mute on this issue. Bro, what? Like, okay, it's important to know that this isn't actually an uncommon belief. Maybe you even hold it yourself. These folks might call themselves red letter Christians because they really only listen to what Jesus says in the Bible. The rest of it isn't really that important. Now, the ironic thing about this belief is it actually goes in direct contradiction to what Jesus actually taught. He says that I have not come to abolish the law or the prophets, but to fulfill them. What is this law and prophets that he's referring to? Hmm. Oh yeah, it's the scripture. Obviously not the New Testament because that had yet to be written. He's talking about the Old Testament. So did Jesus actually stay silent? No, he was affirming the moral teaching of the Old Testament, the Torah, the law that would, would condemn homosexuality. Now, even those who would decide that the Old Testament isn't super relevant, they still have to deal with 1 Corinthians where Paul talks about um, neither fornicators nor adulterers nor idolaters nor homosexual will inherit the kingdom of God. I just got to be honest, this whole thing is awful. And it's awful because he's encouraging people to make an excuse for their sin, to justify their sin, to say, no, 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 you're good just as you are. Keep going. I'm not just talking about homosexuality. I'm talking about sex outside of marriage. I'm talking about lust. I'm talking about greed, about pride. Any of these things where you say you're good just as you are, you know, make excuses for it. It's not a big deal. Jesus was pretty silent about that. He only mentioned it once or twice. You know, he kind of whispered on those things. Really? Really? Is that what we're going to do? We're going to justify our own sin? That doesn't bring about any sort of healing or redemption. It just leaves us stuck in bondage. The truth will set you free. And the truth is, is that your sin separates you from God. But Jesus in his mercy descended from on high to live the sinless life that we could never live, to die on the cross, the death we deserve to die for our sins against God. But he rose again on the third day, defeating sin and death, that we could be forgiven, that we could have a restored relationship with him and we would be given eternal life. That message becomes meaningless if you say you are good just as you are, if you abolish the foundation or the moral callings of the Bible, if you push those aside to say, those are kind of old things, you know, we didn't really, Jesus didn't mention it, so, you know, and even though he did, but Jesus didn't mention it, so we don't really acknowledge those things. Man, you're going to be stuck in this place of bondage to sin, meanwhile thinking you're good to go, and you see Jesus dying on the cross, and you ask yourself, why did he do that? After all, I'm a pretty good guy, and, uh, you know, I, I'm good to go. Jesus says love is sacred. Um, where did he say that? I saw a talk by Vody Bauckham recently and he made a tremendous point. Love is sinful when it is oriented at the wrong object. If you love the things of this world, if you love sin, if you love yourself more than you love others, your love is not good. It's not godly. It's not sacred. It's sinful. Now, if you really want to know how to love, you need to know God because God is love. But we need to ask ourselves, how can we know God truly if we throw away his words as not relevant to us anymore? There's only one unforgivable sin. The sin against the Holy Spirit. Blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. And if you think preaching against love isn't blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, then I don't know what is. When people love each other, to break that up, that is blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. And it's time for someone in church to speak up that what we are preaching is ridiculous. Whose standard of love are you using? Where are the boundaries that you have? You say two people love each other. Ooh, that would be a sinful, that would be a most blasphemous, unforgivable sin to break those people up. But ultimately, you do have standards. Maybe, I would hope so. You probably would have be opposed to three people getting married or a man and a child getting married. So there are some sort of boundaries that you're putting around it. 
But where are you getting those from? You're basically just making them up yourself because you've abandoned the morality of the scripture. You say it's ridiculous for somebody to break up two people that love each other. Well, God has boundaries around it. He says that you should not be unequally yoked with the non-believer too. So he would have a problem with that as well. Or a heterosexual couple sleeping together. God has boundaries against this. So you say it's ridiculous. It's not ridiculous according to the Bible. Yeah, according to the culture, it is extremely ridiculous. It makes no sense whatsoever. But that's where you determine, okay, where do my allegiances lie? Whose foundation will I stand on? The word of God or the ever-changing morality of the culture? And we have to follow Jesus on another level. His words deserve to be the highest. He spoke for the Father. No one else spoke for the Father other than Jesus Christ. That is what makes him the Messiah. That is why we are here. I guess he's trying to say once again that because Jesus spoke for the Father that we only pay attention to those red letter verses in the scripture and everything else is pretty much irrelevant. <laughs> but that's kind of putting out the point where, uh, you know, Moses got the Ten Commandments from Mount Sinai from God and brought them down. It was like, okay, in that context, was Moses speaking for God? Well, he had the tablets, right? You think of the prophets of the Old Testament. Were they speaking for God? Yeah, they were. Yeah, maybe, you know, some of them false prophets, obviously. Uh, you disregard those. But no, they had this connection. They it's communication between them and God where they passed on, hey, this is what's going on, guys. This is what God wants to tell you, right? You think of Jonah. You got to go to Nineveh, Nineveh to, to proclaim my truth, to, to tell them to repent. Um, so it, it's like, we're, are we abandoning all this other stuff where God was communicating to us through these different people? Yeah, absolutely. Jesus is God. And so we, we should obviously take his words into our heart, in the deepest place of our heart, 100%. But it's disregarding the fact that God has given us his word for teaching, for correction, for training in righteousness. It is sufficient for us. And he's not abolished the law, but he's come to fulfill the law. He hasn't changed his moral stance. No, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And if we get confused thinking that he is discriminatory toward anybody for a lifestyle or for a race or for interracial marriage, think about 50 years ago when people weren't even getting allowed to get married in some areas when they weren't of the same race. How ridiculous that is. Actually, God is discriminatory against behaviors. That's why he calls certain things sin and an abomination. And that's why he says you're either for me or against me. So in terms of behaviors, yeah, he does call out sin and he does call people to repent, to change, to trust in him and be transformed. And then we talk about interracial marriage. Uh, yeah, people did some pretty evil things and they used the Bible to justify their own hatred and bigotry. Absolutely. But then you search the scriptures and you find out there's no foundation for the, uh, to be against interracial marriage. It's just no foundation for it, right? But then you look at something like homosexuality, gay, gay marriage. And you come to find out the whole Bible is so thick and rich with this picture of what it means to have marriage between a man and a wife and what that represents. And also testifying to the abomination that anything contrary to God's design is. So it's very different. Also, scripture is a foundation for human equality, that we were created in the image of God. And when you abandon that, all of a sudden we're just animals, survival of the fittest. Okay, yeah, certain groups are more powerful than others. Why can't they treat uh, somebody else in any particular way that they want? That's why the word of God rises us up into the same place of image bearers. And this world became more loving than Christians. And there are people in this city that preach hate. And we have to come against it as Christians. We gotta be like, that is ridiculous. Jesus would never do that to anybody. He would love people. He says the culture has become more loving than the church. And I just have to believe that his definition of love is total acceptance and approval of however people want to behave. And ultimately, Christians, we can't get behind that because Jesus doesn't get behind that. When you look at what he actually did, think of the woman caught in adultery. Yes, he cast away the, the hypocrites and those who would look to cast judgment on her. But he doesn't just leave her like that. He says, go and sin no more. He calls her to repentance. Does 
does he do that because he's hateful because he's unloving because he doesn't you know oh man he should just jesus should just accept that woman and how she wanted to live exactly as she was and just give her his full approval but he showed love to her and yet he called her to something better to step into his calling for her. The Bible talks about sexual immorality waging war on our souls. And so if you know somebody that's engaging in that lifestyle and you just kind of give them your, you know, your artificial positivity and just in your heart, you know, okay, this is not, this is not good, but you're just, yeah, you're good, man. You're good. I approve of it. It's awesome. I'm so happy for you. It's like the friend that you see walking towards the side of a cliff and you say, Oh man, you know, I'm so happy for you. I'm so glad you're going in that direction. You know, I'm sure it's awesome over there. Meanwhile, you know, there's a cliff on the other side. You, you do anything. You say, hey, friend, friend, I care about you. And I know you can't see it right now, but that's going to be harmful for you. And maybe they won't listen. Maybe they won't. And maybe you'll still be there and, and you'll you continue to encourage them towards what is right. Um, but you at least need to begin that conversation. It's not loving to just stay silent and never let them know where you stand. Or even worse, encourage them off the side. He would love people on a level. He would love people so amazingly open because he doesn't want to change your sexuality. He wants to change your mentality. That might sound real nice on a t-shirt, but you're making a crucial error. He's treating sexual orientation as something that cannot be moved, an intrinsic part of your being, wholly connected to your identity. But the beauty of what Christ came to do is he came to give us a new identity that we would no longer hold onto the ways of our past self, but step into and embrace this new life. Now, this doesn't mean that we don't still struggle, but rather those desires become our foe and are no longer our friend. It's very different than taking them on as an immutable aspect of your identity. God is in the business of changing desires and that might not all happen for you all at once. For some people it does. For some people it's a progressive thing. For other folks, they're, they're struggling with their whole life, but they don't connect it anymore with their identity because they're a new person in Christ. He wants to change you. He doesn't want you to be hateful. He values faith, justice, and mercy. And here we are judging people for things he never even said. Do I even need to say anything about that? I mean, he, he's emphasizing all these like fluffy, nice aspects of God, but he's forgetting about the judgment of God and the wrath of God and the holiness of God. Like that's an important, like you got to think about it as a big picture, right? You can't just take, oh man, I like the, the squishy, nice, um, you know, welcoming, encouraging, fully accepting Jesus. But ultimately you're creating an idol if you're disconnecting that from his truth, from his holiness. I think one of the big lessons here is that simply because a pastor or or speaker or YouTuber for that matter speaks about something with great passion doesn't mean they're speaking truth. Just because they're weeping amidst their words doesn't mean their words are wise. I'm sure many people heard the agony and passion in this man's voice and, and declared to themselves, well, I guess he must be speaking for God. Look how much he cares. But that's why discernment is so important. We must weigh the words against scripture. Thank you guys so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, subscribe because I'm putting out new videos all the time. A huge shout out to everyone on Patreon for supporting me in what I'm doing. You guys are such an amazing blessing and I love to have so much fun over there with you on the Discord and our video chats and putting ex exclusive videos for you guys. It's just my, my great pleasure and my gift to you for supporting me in that. So thank you so much guys and I will see you later. God bless.